Um, for those of you who were here for our uh, inaugural episode of this series in the fall, uh, welcome back and uh, thank you for returning. For those of you who are uh, new to this series, I'm just going to take a minute to um, tell you what it's about and what we're trying to do uh, before introducing the, uh, the speakers today. Uh, so basically, the, the Tackling Global Challenges series, uh, our goal is to highlight a particular problem area in sustainable energy or sustainability and uh, provide useful uh, information to a broad audience and uh, insights on opportunities for uh, developing uh, new solutions. And I would say that our, our intent is to, uh, is to basically provide a forum where external experts can help uh, educate us and, and the community about uh, these important areas. Uh, our hope is that it will also spur some uh, creative thinking uh, to develop uh, new solutions. And uh, if those solutions are in the, the form of uh, innovations or uh, inventions that can lead to uh, new ventures, then uh, that's something that we, uh, we certainly love to support. It's a big part of what the Tomcat Center does. And so we would be happy to uh, connect with you um, down the road, if, if that may be. There's also many other resources here at Stanford uh, to support that. So uh, this year for the inaugural series, we picked the theme of uh, plastic uh, and specifically the, the environmental footprint of the production of plastics and the crisis of plastic uh, pollution. We picked this area because it's a really big problem. Um, it's also incredibly multifaceted uh, as, as you'll see. Uh, and we think uh, it's sort of ripe for many different kinds of innovations, whether they're science and technology innovations, um, innovations in uh, logistics, uh, perhaps even uh, changes in, in policy to, to address this problem. So uh, today we have uh, two speakers who I will introduce uh, very shortly. Um, what we're gonna do is that they're gonna give uh, two uh, presentations back to back. Um, that'll be about 30 or 40 minutes. Uh, and then there will be a question and answer session. Uh, so Donica provided you uh, with a link to poll everywhere. You can use that to submit questions. There are questions uh, that have been submitted already. You can see those when you uh, uh, click on that link. You can also use that to uh, vote for questions that you want to elevate to the top of the list uh, to, to see the, the speaker's answer. So I'll, I'll, I'll do my best to draw some questions from that uh, list that Donica, she just put the link in the chat as well. It should have been in your, in your email. Um, and then the other thing I want to call your attention to is that uh, we do have a Tomcat Center LinkedIn group. Um, this is a great way to connect with uh, a, a really broad and vibrant community of uh, researchers, scholars, innovators, entrepreneurs, investors, et cetera, uh, working in, in these areas of sustainable energy and sustainability. So I would encourage you to join that LinkedIn group um, if, you, if you haven't already. Okay, so with that, let, let, me, um, let me introduce our speakers today. We're, we're incredibly fortunate uh, to be joined by uh, two people from the US Department of Energy really uh, helping create new <laughs> innovations to solve important problems in energy and sustainability is, is what they do for a living. Um, our first uh, speaker is uh, Jack Lunard. Jack is currently a program director at ARPA-E, that's the um, Advanced Research Projects Agency for Energy. Uh, ARPA-E really supports high potential and uh, high impact technologies, the development of these technologies that are uh, too early for the private sector, but have uh, great potential to have a transformative impact. Um, and they rely um, heavily, uh, almost exclusively, on the expertise and creativity of their program directors to really identify the opportunity areas um, to uh, put out calls for funding and really craft the programmatic uh, uh, content. 
So Jack has uh, served in this role since 2019. Um, prior to joining RPE, he was the VP of Business Development for the Strategic Development Group at Chesapeake uh, Utilities. Um, and prior to that, he was the VP and um, CTO of the Gas Technology Institute. Um, he has, uh, his, his interests lie uh, very much in uh, the area of energy infrastructure, um, methane emissions reductions, uh, low carbon fuels uh, and several other related areas. And he's been responsible for creating a number of, of programs over the past couple of years at, at RPE to target uh, opportunities in these, in these areas. Um, his uh, background is in chemical engineering and uh, he did his PhD across the Bay at, at Berkeley in chemical engineering. So uh, also joining us today with really sort of a, a complimentary perspective on the, on the problem area, as, as you'll see, is uh, Jay Fitzgerald. Um, I've, I've actually known Jay for, for more than 10 years. Uh, he was one of the first graduate students I, I met when I started here at, uh, at Stanford in, in 2009. Uh, so he did his PhD work uh, here in the chemistry department uh, with my, my colleague, uh, Jayden Kosla. Uh, after uh, graduating, he became a, a science and technology uh, policy fellow uh, at the U.S. Department of Energy that's sponsored by the American Association for the Advancement of Science, a very prestigious fellowship. He started out in the, uh, in the Office of Science at the DOE, uh, developing programs for uh, basic research. Uh, and then I think his interests evolved into the uh, applications. Uh, so he migrated over to EERE and specifically the bioenergy technologies offices. Um, he started there as a, as a technology manager, um, helping to craft uh, new programs uh, in the areas of synthetic biology and um, plastic, um, performance advantage plastics, chemical and bio, uh, biological plastic conversions. Uh, and recently was promoted to uh, chief scientist for the bioenergy uh, technology office. Um, so I, I just want to make one disclaimer before I turn it over to them. Um, they have very kindly um, offered their time and their insights today to share with you. Um, they are here as individuals. They are not speaking on behalf of the Department of Energy. Um, so please don't in interpret any of the views or ideas they express as as DOE uh, policy. So uh, with that, let me uh, turn it over to Jack and Jay. Thank you so much for, for joining us. Uh, oh, hi, this is Jack Menard. Uh, uh, thanks, Jay, for, Matthew, for the kind, uh, kind uh, introduction. Uh, just want to check that you can see my screen that I'm putting up. Yes. Okay, great. Well, on, on behalf of Jay, I'd like to start by saying thanks to, to Matt for inviting us to, to, to speak today and also to Danica for her help getting this presentation together. Uh, it, as Matt mentioned, I'll be covering the first part of the presentation, then I'll hand off to Jay. Um, and. Uh, uh, I'm hoping that the level of discussion in, is such in this presentation that it intrigues you, but I've, I've tried to intentionally keep it not too deep so that we have space for the questions. But uh, please feel free to, to dig in as, uh, as we go through the talk here. So let me start out by, uh, with the first slide by just prefacing, um, you know, Matt asked us to outline the challenges around plastics, a topic which has really gotten increased attention in recent years. Um, this slide is really intended to outline the situation with plastic packaging materials, including highlighting the, the well-known observation that soon there will be more plastics and fish in the sea. Uh, um, but while this 78 tons of plastic packaging may be highly visible, it's only the tip of the iceberg. And so let's dig down a little bit deeper here. Um, but first, let's ask the question, what what are our goals and, and what are the options here? You know, just like uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, there's, a, there's kind of a pyramid of, of, of options here, layers of objectives. 
at the bottom, you know, the core objective is to keep plastics out of the environment. That means landfilling, um, um, perhaps, um, but it's certainly, you know, better than having having the plastics escape into the sea and, and create degradation across the environment. Um, you know, moving up though, you know, from just landfilling, we have the opportunity to to look at uh, um, energy recovery from these plastics. The embedded energy is is pretty significant, several quads of energy. Um, that's considered downcycling, by the way, you know, kind of a negative sounding term, but I think we could all agree it's better than just putting in a landfill. And, and as we move up the, the chain, well, maybe instead of just capturing the energy content, we can capture the chemical value uh, is, is upcycling. Um, and, and that's kind of where my talk is going to focus. Uh, the uh, the, the uh, intent here is to cover these initial topics and then let Jay take you to the next level and, and on to the top of the pyramid. So we're not just gonna start at the bottom of the pyramid, we're gonna start at the bottom of everything, which is collecting the garbage. Um, it's, uh, it's almost, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, essential to, to start by recognizing that before we can get into the world of plastics recycling, we first have to deal with the solid waste problem. And it's a, uh, it's a first step in what's a long and extens expensive and technically challenging path to managing plastics. And it's a big job. It's 2 billion tons of solid waste a year, and it's getting bigger every day. It tends to be a locally managed problem. Plastics are just a small part of the solid waste, typically less than 20%. So right away, we need to face the issues of separation and contamination. And those two issues carry through all of the rest of the steps that we'll be discussing. So let me say a few words about collecting garbage. It's expensive, primarily because of transportation costs. And the business model for trash often relies on subsidies because after all, it's trash. It's not a product. So the challenge is how to get people to pay to get rid of it responsibly instead of paying nothing and dropping it on the ground. Um, and so as we talk about you know, managing plastics and trying to climb up our pyramid to the highest levels, I think one of the things that we have to recognize from the very beginning is we need to look at creating financial incentives. And that's gonna require rethinking the entire business model of garbage. And remember, it's not just the plastic waste we make today that we have to deal with. 80% of the plastic that's ever been made is still with us. So we need to figure out how to you know, cover the cost for going back and collecting this legacy plastic that's, that's still out there and uh, essentially paying for it in the rears. I think a lot of times there's a misconception that this plastic problem is a, is a problem of the poor countries, and it's not exclusively a poor country problem. The, uh, it's interesting, the United States uh, collects more than 95% of its solid waste, but we consume so much plastic that we still manage to rank amongst the top coastal polluters. And that's before we acknowledge that the U.S. and a lot of other rich countries have historically exported a significant amount of their plastics into poorer countries. Um, now, more recently, China and other Asian countries have started to impose bans on these on this, you know, essentially transfer of, of plastic and other waste. And the updated Basel Convention is seeking to eliminate this practice completely. But again, you know, we have to recognize that, you know, this whole issue is not just a problem of poor countries, it's a problem for rich countries. So now that we have to keep what we make, let's talk about how we can recycle plastic and opportunities to make improvements. So remember the comment about separation and contamination. Now the US is settled on this philosophy of what's called single stream recycling, where residents and, and many commercial entities do minimal sorting, putting a mix of materials into blue bins. Sometimes our separation is, is poor, leading to contamination. Note that other countries, particularly in the EU, do a lot more upfront source separation, but that idea really hasn't caught on in the US. So what we have is a lot of blue bins and all that material goes to one of about 500 MERS or material recovery facilities. 
uh, I'm sorry, about 500 of these MRFs are in, in the U.S. And, and these MRFs take on the next level of sorting using a mix of machines, humans, and artificial intelligence, depending on the, the, the sophistication of the facility. Um, and they separate what comes in into saleable products. It costs about $75 to $100 a ton to process what comes in. And depending on the MRF, as much as 20% of what comes in is either not recyclable materials at all or so contaminated that it needs to go to the landfill after paying that money to sort it. It's quite painful since it costs about $50 a ton to landfill. And the cost of the land, landfill and poorly separated blue bin waste can erase any margin from selling profitable items like aluminum and cardboard. So again, we need technology to reduce costs, probably new business models, and equally important, a lot of education so people put the right stuff in their blue bin and put the other stuff in the trash. So aside from being expensive, plastics recycling is hard. And why is it hard? Well, first, because there's so much of it. The first slide alluded to that 78 million tons of packaging is just the tip of the iceberg. But annual plastic production is approaching 400 million tons a year. Now, to give you an idea with that, that as a metric, that's roughly two thirds of the mass of all human beings. So someplace out there, there is a two thirds, maybe a four to five foot statue of you made out of waste plastic being created this year. It's a, it's a staggering number. And remember, about 90% is single use. So think Coke bottles instead of Tupperware. And when you look in the U.S., our 3 million tons of recycled plastics out of 36 million tons produced reflects that we have a long way to go. So why is this? Well, first of all, only a few of the plastics that you know, are labeled as recyclable are actually recycled. Uh, PET bottles and high-density polyethylene are the money makers. The rest of this stuff, not so much so. There's an emerging technology for polypropylene, but the rest of this stuff, they don't even want to see in the blue bins. That all contributes to that $50 of, of waste landfill after you've paid the $75 to sort it. The, um, you know, even the two most profitable and easiest to recycle materials, PET bottles and HDPE bottles, have only about a 30% recycling rate in the United States. So we have to ask our question, you know, why is this so hard? Well, the first thing to note is it's more expensive to recycle than to use fossil resources to make new plastics. So you have a tremendous financial disincentive. Contamination means that valuable plastics get thrown out and good plastics get degraded by trans materials. And even within a category, say HDPE or LDPE, there are thousands of grades of plastics, each with unique properties, additives, colors, et cetera. You can't make a quality product from a broad mixture of plastics, even within a single class, without first deconstructing the plastics all the way back to the monomer building box. And in the case of thermoset plastics, it may not even be possible to break these back into monomers at all. So in addition to the sorting, the contamination, and chemistry problems, there's also regulatory issues. For example, I think most people would probably be cautious about using recycled materials and food packaging or for, implant, for implanted medical devices. So let's assume we've collected the garbage, sorted the plastics, and now we want to monetize these plastics. Well, the simplest option is to burn the plastics to recover energy. And burning plastics to make electricity is about between about 25 and 30% efficient. Um, so it's not the greatest thing to do, but it's a way to monetize it. But there's a challenge there. First of all, Waste to energy plants are not very common, at least in the United States. There were several that were built in the 80s and 90s, but not much since then. The other thing is plastics were never their target. The waste to energy business model is based on tipping fees and operating permits limit the amount of energy they can run through the plant. So they prefer trash with low heating value per unit of mass. Plastics are exactly the opposite. They're some of the highest heating value per pound of materials that you can find. And so they're much less profitable to process in a waste energy plant. Well, and the second problem is that the whole price of electricity, which supported these waste energy plants, continues to fall, putting their economics in peril. And finally, of course, nobody wants a waste energy plant in their backyard in the United States, especially in the urban areas where the waste is. 
So the picture at the top here, this is the old Philly waste incinerator. It, uh, it's long since shut down and it's now been converted into a riverfront entertainment district. In contrast, in the EU, where waste energy is much more common, they, uh, they build waste energy plants in the middle of their cities that win architectural awards and, in fact, double as ski areas and climbing walls. This is one in Copenhagen. So before we give up on the topic of burning waste, I just want to mention that there is another area, and that's the cement manufacturing. Cement is, uh, is a very energy-intensive product. And uh, cement kilns are known as omnivores. And this is an industry that has long sought out opportunity fuels. So there will probably always be an option to burn some plastics for energy recovery, even if that's not necessarily the best use of the plastics or the highest value. So what are some of our options if we're not just going to burn the plastics for energy recovery? And, and, and there's several chemical processes that you can look at. These are classes of chemical processes, pyrolysis, catalytic cracking, catalytic depolymerization amongst them. Moving down this list of options, the processes become more selective to higher value products, but it also comes with a higher cost and more sensitivity to contaminants. There are several pyrolysis projects around the world and even in the United States that are online and, and even more getting built. These other technologies are being researched, including by Jay's group and by ARPA-E. Maybe just to say a few words about what ARPA-E is doing in this area. Um, um, earlier this year, we launched our reuse program. It's a fairly modest $4 million exploratory program, testing whether small modular plants could get built that would flange up with the size of a MRF, so about 100 to 500 tons per day. And the idea here is that it's very hard to move waste. It's very expensive. So what you do is you build the plants where the waste is aggregated so it doesn't have to be moved. And instead, you make a liquid, which is easily transported. And our goal is to try and make a fungible, high-energy liquid product with these modular plants. We've got four teams, and they're exploring a range of products from a refinery blend stock that would essentially compete with crude oil at about $50 a barrel, to, to one that's looking to make lube stocks worth up to as much as uh, up, to, up to as much as ten dollars a gallon. RPE is also uh, recently announced its Open 21 program. So Open 21 is just that. RPE accepts ideas in any topic related to energy, and uh, there's a hundred million dollars available. Hopefully, this talk is going to stimulate some of your ideas, and if so. The good news is if you have good ideas, you still have plenty of time to get your, uh, your concept papers in. They're due April 6th. So I hope we see a couple of uh, proposals come out of this talk today. So I'd like to uh, close with uh, a slide that uh, I borrowed from Jay. Um, it addresses what could be in terms of jobs and economic impact. You know, I started my talk by, by noting that plastics represent an environmental and an energy challenge but they also represent an economic opportunity. Now, Jay's gonna pick up the story where I leave off, seeking the higher value uh, propositions for plastics and taking you to the top of the pyramid. So with that, I'd like to say thanks for your attention. Look forward to questions and Jay, the floor is yours. All right, can you all hear me? Yes, that's yes. Great. All right, perfect. I'm just gonna go ahead and put this in presentation mode here. And great, I just wanted to echo Jack's thanks to Matt and to the Tomcat Center for inviting us here to speak today. It's really an honor to be able to talk to all of you. And um, Jack has done the, the really hard work of, of painting the picture of, you know, how do we handle waste as a environmental, um, as the environmental challenge that it is and make sure that it doesn't end up in our environments and, and that we can actually do something with it instead of uh, using it for, you know, just, just putting it into landfills or, or burning it. I'm gonna take a little bit of a, a different perspective and talk about what we might be able to do if we're actually able to sort um, some of the different contaminants that come along with plastics out 
and what we might be able to turn plastics into. Um, and I think there's been a lot of talk about how we handle plastics as a waste management issue. And I think that's first and foremost. And that's you know the reason why I think Jack led this off. And that's, I think, the most important issue to cover here. But one that's not talked about a lot is how plastics actually represent a climate opportunity as well. A lot of energy actually goes into manufacturing plastics. Um, and what you can see here is that in the industrial sector, um, plastics uh, are a significant amount of the energy or the greenhouse gas emissions that the United States produces. Um, and the industrial sector is actually fairly large. And so when we think about other types of, of um, sectors that we might want to decarbonize as a Department of Energy, plastics are actually somewhat comparable to things like fuel use for aviation or fuel use in ships and boats, um, which might not be intuitive uh, since we, we think we burn so much fuel you know, every time we, we take a plane flight. Um, but plastics actually are comparable to that. But they're inherently really hard to decarbonize because they are carbon-based. Um, and until we come up with a different type of base material for these types of, of things, we're going to continue to need to make them out of carbon. Um, so plastics account for about 2% of, of domestic greenhouse gas um, emissions. And as you can see here, they're comparable to these other sectors. But with that said, not all plastics are created equal in terms of uh, you know, how much greenhouse gas emissions they produce in their, in their manufacturing. We uh, recently funded uh, a consortium called the Bottle Consortium that I'll talk about in a little bit. And they ran an analysis basically trying to outline through using the tool called the Manufacturing uh, Flow Through Industries, uh, what each of the supply chain energy um, consumptions were for every type of plastic polymer produced, or at least for about the top 20 or so. What you can see here is that plastics consume a varying amount of energy um, in different types of polymers, like polyethylene here at the top is the most commonly used plastic. But there are things down here like PC, polycarbonate, um, that actually consume or actually create much more greenhouse gas emissions. And I don't know if you can see my cursor here, um, but they create much more greenhouse gas emissions than you would think based on their actual amount of consumption. So it gives us some sense of what, what good targets might be if we're trying to approach this problem from a greenhouse gas perspective. And so we know what these plastics are now and we have kind of a baseline created in terms of what things we can target. Um, and, and I did wanna highlight here too that plastics consume about 3% of total US energy use. And that's really an energy efficiency opportunity, I think in addition to a greenhouse gas opportunity. So if you can make production more efficient through a variety of different means, you might be able to limit that total supply chain energy. So I think one of the next questions you might ask is why not just stop using plastic overall? And I think it's a great question. Um, you know, we're often encouraged to use things like uh, reusable shopping bags or to, to substitute things like aluminum cans for plastic bottles. And those are, those are great ideas. And I think that they do have really a role to play in limiting single use plastics. But it is a complicated story because things like cotton bags have about 130 times the global warming potential that a, that a single use plastic bag does. So you have to reuse that plastic bag, or sorry, that cotton bag about 130 times before you're gonna break even from a greenhouse gas perspective. And these, I mentioned that not because we shouldn't be using cotton bags, we certainly should, but just, just because you have to use them a lot more than, than you might think because plastics are a really efficient material to produce. And so they also have very large benefits um, in terms of the way that our society uses them to do things like preserve or prevent food spoilage. Um, and so there have been some estimates in terms of the amount of greenhouse gas emissions that we save through being able to continue to use food that would have expired if it didn't have plastic packaging around it. And it's around 10% of the amount of energy that went into food. So those have really important implications for when we use plastics and when we use alternatives. Um, and I don't want to come off here, I guess, as a plastic evangelist. I think I'm just raising these points to kind of say we need to we need to think about how we can really efficiently use plastics because they're going to be around and they're they're going to be needed to be made more efficient in order for us to keep using them and and use them in a sustainable manner. On the right side here, you can see um, total energy, global warming potential, acidification, and smog from a variety of different recycled plastics. And we know that we can recycle plastics using today's technologies, like Jack mentioned, uh, most often mechanical recycling. And they really do save a lot of the greenhouse gas emissions uh, when you use these recycled materials to create new plastics. Unfortunately, also as Jack mentioned, there's really low recycling rates. So we don't get these things into the system enough for those, uh, for those benefits to really be realized. In addition, Jack also mentioned downcycling, um, or which is uh, what mechanical recycling often leads to. 
versus a closed loop. And so you might think when you recycle a PET bottle that you can make a new PET bottle out of that. But almost all the PET bottles that are recycled go into things like uh, the manufacture of carpet fiber or other types of, of kind of uh, fiber-based materials rather than going into a new plastic bottle. Um, and that highlights the need for closed loop recycling. And closed loop recycling is going to mean that you can break things back down into monomers or into other chemical intermediates that can then be used to produce similar quality materials. And that's a lot of what we're trying to do in EERE is look at how can we create that type of cycle. And so new, new technologies have that potential for same cycling and they also have other energy and environmental benefits. So to flip back to Jack's slide here, I'm gonna kind of focus on uh, the minimizing fossil content and maximizing chemical energy recovery bits of the pyramid here. And then uh, we'll save a little bit of time at the end to talk about kind of the, the tip of the pyramid and how we can you know, more holistically redesign the system as a whole. But, but there are two basic things that we focused on uh, at EERE when trying to tackle this problem, and they really do fall into these two categories. So what do ideal solutions look like here in terms of uh, redesigning plastics and also in terms of redesigning recycling processes? So if you were to redesign plastics, you would, you would redesign them with the end of life concerns in mind and really with those things up front so that you knew how the plastic was either gonna be recycled or th how the plastic was gonna degrade in the environment or a compost facility as you were designing it. Um, you'd also have to design them to be compatible with current infrastructure. There are a lot of stories out there um, that are, are when you know things that were designed as biodegradable materials have gotten into recycling facilities, and because they have chemical triggers in them uh, that um, you know are meant to break the, the material down, they actually can contaminate much larger versions of failed material. And so you have to be really careful when you're designing these new types of materials that you design them to be compatible with today's infrastructure um, or with a, a, a very slight variant on today's infrastructure that's likely to be implemented soon. And like Jack said, these, these many uh, material recovery facilities often operate on really razor thin margins. And so you have to make sure that you're not creating too large of an ask for those uh, people who are actually doing the sorting of the waste to be able to utilize your new material. Um, ideally, on the next bullet, you would create things that are performance advantaged. And so you could recreate, you know, polyethylene exactly from a bio-based source, and maybe you could lower the greenhouse gas emissions. But ideally, you could create a new material that had properties similar to polyethylene, but maybe that was more easily recyclable or that, that you know, had, could actually biodegrade in the environment. Um, and lastly, you want to think about lowering the global warming potential of these materials by using things like bio-based materials or using different types of processing techniques. So the second major thing I wanted to talk through today in terms of, of things that we could focus on are how we could improve recycling processes. And so mechanical recycling is great, but basically what happens there is that you take the recycled material, you chip it up, um, and then you, you, uh, you know, blend and, and compatibilize those chips. And then you're able to put those into some sort of processors like an extruder to make a new, uh, a new type of plastic. But every time you do that, you're going to end up with worse properties than in your starting material. And so we took as our baseline kind of how do we improve on re mechanical recycling? How can we create intermediate streams that actually have the ability to be upgraded efficiently into, into final end products? We want these recycling processes also to be tolerant of things like contaminants, um, energy and material efficient, and work with things like uh, maybe not unsorted material, but at least unsorted plastics, or be able to be uh, tolerant of things that are gonna come along with plastics in terms of, of a recycling stream. And maybe then also look at non-traditional feedstocks here. So with all of those challenges in mind, we, um, we at the DOE launched an initiative to uh, you know, tackle those challenges. And, and one of the first things that we did um, because uh, the Department of Energy has such a, a wide-ranging national laboratory complex that um, handles or is able to, to really put forward innovative solutions to ideas, was we sort of charged the national laboratories with coming up with um, ideas on how you would tackle this plastics waste problem. And through that process, the bottle consortium was launched. And this is about a $10 million a year effort. Um, FY21, so this September, was the official kickoff of the consortium. And the consortium has a vision to deliver the types of selective and scalable technologies that enable this type of recycling that we've been talking about. And, and their mission really is to develop robust processes that can handle these, these types of existing and new plastics waste, as well as to design new plastics that are recyclable or biodegradable by design. And you can see a few of the metrics here that the consortium came up with. And those include things like 50% energy savings relative to virgin material, 
We know that that's possible with mechanical recycling and downcycling, uh, but that only actually is able to access a fraction of the different types of plastics that would be utilized. So we're going to try to do that for all different types of plastics um, so that we can get all of those up to that 50% energy savings bar. In addition, we're looking at carbon recovery. So you know, it, it's very easy to, to take a plastic stream and maybe pick out 10% of it and trash the other 90% and make a high value product. But really at the end of the day, that doesn't solve our problem. What we want is processes that are material efficient and can actually capture the carbon and capture the value in the material um, so that that can go on to have a, a second life. Um, and lastly, the bottle consortium in particular is focused on upcycling. And upcycling is providing an economic incentive above the price of reclaimed materials. So being able to use a deconstructed stream in a novel application, that might actually get you um, a higher value for your material. And so Greg Beckham is the PI uh, shown here for that consortium. And it's a collaboration between a variety of different um, universities and national laboratories. We actually were, were fortunate enough to add uh, Slack to our uh, membership uh, team this fall, which has been a great addition to the community to be able to um, look at some of the catalytic processes that we're using um, to break down plastics in a little bit more detail and have a better mechanistic, me sorry, mechanistic understanding of how those things happen. And so at the end of the day, the bottle consortium really is trying to do what's shown here on the right of the screen, which is to go from a linear economy for plastics to something that's more of a circular economy. And I'll expand on that theme in a second here. So this is what the consortium likes to call their placemat slide, which is, um, I guess, if you're trying to educate your, your, your kids, you can give this to them while they eat so that they can, they can pick up on some of the themes here. I'm not quite sure how, how well that would work with uh, my second grader, but you know, it's, it's always worth a try, I guess. Um, so the idea here is to take plastic waste and to deconstruct that plastic waste through some sort of um, either a biological or chemical process. And so the things that they're looking at are thermal catalysis, electrocatalysis, biocatalysis and photocatalysis. Um, and we're doing a lot of techno-economic and life cycle analysis on all of the different types of projects that are proposed within the consortium to make sure that they can meet the metrics that we've proposed and that they're gonna be efficient processes. So once you're able to deconstruct that plastic waste into a raw material um, that's ready for reuse, you can either think about how you would make a new upcycle material out of that that could then have, have an end of life designed into it or you can think about how you might add things like new biomass-based monomers um, to interact with your deconstructed raw material from your fossil-based plastic to create um, a new recycling loop. And so those are the, the two types of, of projects that we're really looking at in terms of end products here. I wanted to throw in this slide just to give everyone a little bit of a chance to realize where the opportunities are from a greenhouse gas emissions perspective for plastics. And so this jewel paper that I referenced earlier broke down for things like polyethylene or, or um, uh, PET, where the different emission sources are for um, each of those plastics. And so what you can see here in blue is that the chemical feedstocks for a plastic account for about half of the greenhouse gas emissions that are associated with um, a, a plastic, a final plastic product. The other large chunk there are things like the actual processing to create the plastics and to create the plastic resins. So those are the two things that are kind of the biggest bang for your buck in terms of greenhouse gas emissions improvements when you're thinking about how you want to create a new, a new type of plastic. So some ideas that we're exploring are using things like bio-based monomers or recycled content, like I mentioned earlier, um, but also looking at things like biological processing or low temperature catalytic processing to limit the amount of uh, emissions that are created through your, your plastic um, production process. You can also think about things like logistics improvements or using green electrons versus, uh, you know, uh, grid average electrons to be able to improve the greenhouse gas uh, profile of your materials. I wanted to, to briefly offer one example of that, and I, I promise I wouldn't, promise Matt, I wouldn't get too much into the chemistry here. So uh, I tried not to put any chemical formulas on here, but you will see a, a little bit of chemistry. And um, if, if Bob Weymouth is actually in the audience, he I was probably wondering why his picture is on the slide here, um, but I, uh, in, in talking to Bob Allen, who's here on the left and actually developed um, this IBM Volcap process, he made me promise uh, if I was giving this seminar at Stanford to be able to give, give a shout out to, to Bob Weymouth for looking at a lot of the base catalyzed depolymerization processes uh, that eventually led to this Volcap process. And the Volcap process is a really interesting process that checks a lot of the boxes that I mentioned on the previous slide. So it uses a volatile amine catalyst um, that's relatively inexpensive 
And that catalyst can selectively cleave ester bonds in polyethylene terephthalate, which has those a those, uh, little bit weaker bonds while leaving other polymers intact. And so what you can imagine with this is that you could do things like sequential processing. And so what I've shown here are some really dirty types of PET inputs. Um, and this is the stuff that material recyclers are actually faced with. And so at the top here, you see clean colored flake, which has about 0.5% contaminants. And that is one thing uh, which was surprising to me when starting learning more about plastic waste is that even this stuff is considered by the people who want to make, say, a new plastic bottle to be unusable because it has a half a percent of contaminants and it's going to have color contaminants more importantly. And so being able to remove all of those contaminants is really critical to being able to same cycle this type of waste. It so happens that this, this IBM bulk cap process, because it can operate at low temperatures and with really selective chemistry, can take even dirtier feedstocks than that. So it can take things like curbside dirty mixed contaminants. And after you, uh, you know, sort of liquefy, I guess, all of your um, PET that's in there through this volatile amine hydrolysis process, you end up being able to filter out everything else that was contaminating this. And I've just shown a little piece of filter paper here with a couple different types of plastic remnants that are on there that were obviously not PET. Um, in talking to Bob Allen, he said that when they run this process at larger scales, they'll actually see a giant glob of PET floating up to the top of their reactor. And so it, it actually makes a giant ball of all the things that actually don't dissolve in their volatile amine catalyst. And so you could think about this um, in terms of, of the sequential processing types of things and how you could recover multiple materials out of one deconstruction step. So at the end of the day, they're able to produce this clean colorless monomer. Um, and the monomer can then be repolymerized into things like bottles or into other types of upcycled products or same cycled products. Um, and they're starting to look at things like how could you use this for textiles to recover cotton, which is also another valuable compound that's uh, interwoven with PET to make a lot of clothing. Um, also things like multi-layer packages or, or things like carpet that have inorganic backing. And none of these things are recyclable in any way today. And so they're, they're part of that um, plastic that went you know, straight into kind of the, the trash fraction that Jack was talking about in terms of having no, you know, no reasonable application or no way to recycle those things given the technology that we're looking at um, or that, that's in the market today. So moving on from that example to, to where, do we, where do we see this going overall at the Department of Energy? So we started on um, this past, I guess it was in 2019 that it was officially kicked off, but the Plastic Innovation Challenge. And as part of that challenge, we've gotten together with colleagues at uh, my office, EERE, as well as the Office of Science, um, RPE, and, and our colleagues at Fossil Energy, and come up with kind of a draft um, of a roadmap for where the challenges and opportunities are for plastic over the coming 10-year period. Um, and as part of that, we've developed some metrics um, that we think are achievable by, by 2030. Um, you know, given appropriate emphasis on, on plastic R&D. Um, and those are to develop technologies to address things like end-of-life state for 90% of materials. I mentioned that earlier. We're trying to kind of bring everything up to the baseline that mechanical recycling can produce today on select materials. Um, but as part of those, we also want to hit those energy savings and those carbon utilization metrics. And we also, at the end of the day, want to be cost competitive with incumbent plastic materials and, or processes. Um, and I think like, like Matt mentioned sort of at the outset, um, that may rely on things like policy incentives to be able to use reclaimed or recycled materials to make them cost competitive. Because uh, I think as Jack mentioned, the, the plastic precursors that are used today are just very, very cheap um, on a per pound basis to you know, make these things. And there's less of an incentive to use this recycled material. So I wanted to, to close my talk basically by going back and referencing Jack's pyramid again here. We've discussed um, a couple of ways in, in my talk of minimizing fossil-based content and maximizing chemical recovery. Um, and Jack talked a lot about uh, chemical recovery as well as energy recovery and, and baseline and the most important thing here, which is just keeping plastics out of the environment. We think that by creating these novel types of technologies, we'll be able to create the incentives for less plastic to end up in the environment in the first place if, we, if people see it as sort of a valuable feedstock instead of as a waste management problem. But we have a long way to go until we get to that point. Um, and so I just wanted to point out too that there are both an environmental challenge with, with plastic and keeping it out of the environment. Um, and there's also an energy problem. Plastics consume a lot of energy. And sometimes those things are at odds, right? Like if you just left your plastic in a landfill, it might actually have a better greenhouse gas emissions profile because it's gonna sit, your carbon's gonna sit locked up in a landfill versus being reused. 
But at the end of the day, we have to solve both of these problems simultaneously and come up with sustainable uh, ways to use our plastic um, resources. And so I just put a couple of different things like collection sorting, recycling, and upcycling, and redesign here, but really happy to hear uh, what the community um, thinks about this problem and, and happy, again, to answer any sorts of questions that you all might have that um, might help you further think through the innovative solutions that I, I know you all are, are, are brewing up right now. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll go ahead and close and turn it back over to Matt. Fantastic. Uh, thank you, Jay and, and Jack for uh, really terrific presentations and uh, I, I think a tremendous amount to to ponder and uh, food for, for innovation. So uh, we really appreciate that. Um, yeah, there is a, a lot to ask about. I will, Jay will make a, a conscious effort, not just to ask uh, chemistry questions, although I, I certainly have a, a lot of those. Um, maybe I'll start kind of uh, at, at the bottom, like like Jack um, suggested, at, at the garbage and the, the sorting. I mean, you pointed out some major problems, you know, associated with sorting and collecting um, and what a burden that is for the MRFs and, and how it affects their whole business plan. What, so what does an innovation in sorting look like? I mean, is it is it really just sort of a cultural issue in the U.S. that we just don't, there's some resistance to having individuals sort and if you could overcome that or change that, then it would open up a lot of, of more attractive options or are there technology solutions you see more technology at the MRF or prior to the MRF that could that could help with that problem I think Jack's having trouble connecting on that oh I there you go. sorry there you go yeah, yeah. I was on mute. yeah um so it's, it's interesting, you know, there's a lot of new sensors out there that are uh, use uh, everything from infrared to uh, much more sophisticated techniques to actually scan materials as, as they were coming across. And uh, what you do is you hit like with a puff of, of air or something to push those materials into a sorting bin. There's a lot of artificial intelligence, um, you know, optical sorters. You know, because you have a can, but what about a crushed can? How does that look? And, and, and when you see a crushed bottle, is it a PET bottle or is that a detergent bottle? And so there's been tremendous advantage, advances in terms of automation using artificial intelligence to, uh, to you know, one, get humans out of the equation because it's a pretty nasty job, but also it allows you to go much, much faster and with much higher precision. Um, but but clearly, one of the most important things to do is to educate people as to what they put in that blue bin in the first place. So okay. I don't want to say we need better people, <laughs> but but you know uh, you know more sophisticated technology helps, but certainly more education would go a long way as well. Those are some thoughts. Yeah, I don't know if you had some as well. No, yeah, I think I think those are great thoughts. I think sorting is sorting and collection are are one of the biggest challenges here, and without that, you can't apply any of the advanced technologies you know that we're we're trying to develop and so it really is reliant on making sure that we capture you know capture all the plastic waste to be able to do something uh useful with it great and then sort of moving up the the pyramid a little bit um i, I this is for jack and jay maybe maybe a little bit more for jack but um you, you mentioned so so if i just burn the plastic um to create electricity it's about 25 to 30 percent so that's chemical energy and electricity out, presumably. On the yeah, earth. that's correct. Yeah, and that's just that's just a function of Carnot efficiency. You know, a coal-fired power plant, the most advanced ones are maybe thirty-five to forty percent efficient, and okay, you know, waste energy plants aren't quite as efficient as that. So, so at the end of the day, so if if I'm doing a a fuel, if I'm making a liquid fuel, you highlighted that as sort of one of the options. Um, I'm not sure if that if this is more pyrolysis or cracking or one of the sort of thermal methods for taking the stream that you can't recycle and putting it into a liquid fuel. Are, you know, there's some energy, of, of course, associated in doing that, that conversion. Are, what are you sort of targeting as your ultimate of energy recovery efficiency, I guess is what I would say, you know, relative to this baseline of just putting it in the incinerator to make electricity? 
Yeah, I think I think you could say that a kind of a starting target efficiency would be at least 50%, so compared to 25% for electric generation. And really, um, it, it boils down to, you know, not just what's your energy conversion efficiency, but can you convert that to valuable products? So, for example, if you heat the plastics up too much, you may crack the plastics and make a lot of light gases like methane, which are, are less valuable. Methane's worth three dollars a million BTU. You know, a uh, a liquid that's in the range of gasoline or diesel is worth five times as much. And then the other thing you got to watch out for, like Goldilocks, if you go too far and you heat too much, you make char. And char, you know, it's kind of like coal, so to speak. So you can still use it as a fuel, but it's very, very low value. And so it really represents a a, a degradation. So it's you know, I think, like I say, 50% energy conversion, but what you'd really like to see is maybe 75% or higher to high value products. So you're getting both the efficiency and the dollar gain. Okay, so, so these these sort of modular facilities that you envision, would, would they be targeting one product or do you, do you imagine the sort of mini refineries that would produce a few different streams, maybe a really high value lubricant and then and then some liquid fuels or is that just not feasible on that scale of a couple hundred tons a day? Well, so, you know, um, it depends on what you're putting in. So the, the folks who are looking at, at making these lube stocks are looking to try and take in uh, polyolefin, so HDPE, LDPE, polypropylene. And those molecules can be unzipped with their catalysts to make these lube oils. If you look at what WRI is doing, they're looking at trying to take a broad cut of things, you know, including those, uh, those plastics that nobody even wants to see getting into the MRF. And their technique is, I'll say it's, it's more of a hammer, you know, and they're just going to try and make a lube oil, I'm sorry, a, 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 a crude type feedstock, which would be lower value, but, but you can take a lot more material in and it's a lot more robust, and so maybe it's still quite profitable, even though the the margins on a dollar per unit volume basis are are lower. Okay, okay, thanks. Um, and and sort of moving to uh, recycling. Um, uh, so I, I, this is I, mostly for Jay, but but certainly for both of you, if you have thoughts. So um, thinking about sort of the high level goal of the bottle uh, initiative. Um, you know, improving the the recycling for all materials. Do you, um, you, you certainly talked about like the chemical recycling and I, I have some questions around that, but is there real room for major improvements in mechanical recycling? I mean, you, you sort of described the, the problems with it um, and the fact that you almost inevitably end up at a lower value, you know, product out of that recycled material than the one that, that goes in. Do, do you see opportunities there for innovations that could change that picture? And then, and then, you know, well, I guess I'll ask my related question after that. Yes, yeah, so that's that's the first question. Yeah, I, th I think that's a great question. Um, mechanical recycling is not something that we specifically focused on improving with with that initiative, but that's kind of because we took a you know what is what is what do we think is being underexplored right now um, sort of perspective on the problem. But I think that mechanical recycling is going to be part of any sort of solution. Um, you know, in, in many ways, it's, it's an upfront step for a lot of what might be viewed as, as chemical processes. Like you're going to need to get these things ground into some sort of material that you can feed into a reactor no matter what. And so having, um, you know, those front end steps of mechanical recycling, I think are gonna be really critical. As far as what the, the biggest barriers to improving that are, I mean, it's, it's right now it's just a lot, they have to do so much washing of that material that it becomes really energy and water intensive. Um, to be able to process plastics through there, you know, if there are um, advances that can somehow, you know, limit the limit the amount of water and limit the amount of energy that goes into um, mechanical recycling, I think those could be really impactful. But that's, you know, a, a really hard problem to solve because then you, the less you wash, you know, the more dirty your product is, and and the harder it is to, you know, upcycle or same cycle that material. I see. So, so for the so, so then, what is to be done, and, and and maybe this intersects, you know, back with with some of the the technologies that that Jack's program is looking at. But but what is so you talked about the polyester, and and, and I, I, you know, it's pretty clear to see, you know, the the chemical strategy for for chemical recycling there. But 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 for the you know, hydrocarbon backbones, um, 
yeah, there's some of the un, unzipping, I guess, that, that Jack alluded to. But, but how do you see all of those fitting into the idea of trying to go back to monomer that you could then turn back into plastic uh, and to, to recover value that way? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a great question. I mean, making, you know, making ethylene again out of plastic doesn't seem like a great use of a, a material that's already, already got a lot of carbon-carbon bonds formed in it. And so I think what you're going to want to do at the end of the day is be able to break it into things like Jack talked about that are that are chunks that are useful for a different type of application. And, you know, depending on how uh, much of these types of oils you could produce, you could foresee, you know, using those as a, as a feedstock for all sorts of types of new chemical processes. You know, some of those are going to require, um, you know, doing some oxidative chemistry on your um, you know, smaller, uh, like smaller oligomeric chunks of material uh, to be able to feed those into um, either, you know, a new catalytic process or even a new biological process. We have some projects that are looking at, you know, if you are, are able to make things like a bunch of carbo you know, small molecular weight carboxylic acids, how can you biologically funnel those into then a single product? Um, and that's obviously, you know, additional process steps. So you lose some energy efficiency and you, you add some cost, but you know, it's at least possible to think about how you could channel um, some percentage of those into those high value applications and use bulk material for, you know, other types of applications where um, you weren't able to, to valorize it in a different way. Okay. And it, you touched on this a, a little bit in your talks, but um, I think there's a, a lot of interest in the audience in this area. So can you comment in general on, you know, where you see biodegradable plastics fitting into to this picture. Uh, there's obviously, you know, tremendous benefits to biodegradability if things end up being released and there's there's a lot of stuff being released into the environment. Um, but there are challenges that you alluded to briefly, you know, with respect to the recycling system. So, so what do you think is kind of the ideal solution there? Um, yeah. I can offer an, an initial thought, you know, there's, there's, you know, horses for courses as they say. So, so biodegradability is a, a very valuable property, but but I think you want to make sure that you're matching that property against the uses that you're looking at. So, for example, there are you know high density polyethylene you know fabrications that are intended to last years. You know they line, for example, they line the bottom of rail cars with HDPE to in, improve the flowability of things like coal and gravel out of the bottom. And so when we look at biodegradability. I think it's not a it's not a one size fits all. You know, there's going to be applications for plastics, particularly single use, short lived, you know, materials. You know, the the classic is the you know the the plastic bag that you bring home your groceries in, single use, five minute life. You know, then it's 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 going to be thrown away. But I think you know if you look at that 400 million tons of plastic, there's probably at least half of that that's in applications where it may not be good to have your plastics falling apart before you want them to. I'll just, you know, I, I don't want to sound negative about it. I just want to point out that, you know, it's a, it's a property where it's fit for purpose. We should use it as much as we can. I don't know, Jay, you probably have some more, you know, well-developed thoughts in this area. No, I think, I think you're, you're spot on Jack with um, what you said. I think it has to be really application dependent. Well, you know, a couple of things that I would add are, we really don't have great certification methods for biodegradability right now. And um, I think I saw Mike Biddle on a little bit earlier, but I think he pointed out, you know, he, he's done, you know, his own informal experiments of just putting the biodegradable materials outside and seeing how long it takes them, you know, to go away in ambient conditions. And it's a lot longer than is claimed. And I think one thing that we've actually started uh, down the road of is being able to develop or look at better certification processes or better um, standardized uh, testing conditions for biodegradability to ensure that if you put that something biodegradable, that it actually will biodegrade in, in reasonable conditions. And, you know, that's, it, it's a really hard problem because it is different in soils, it's different in the ocean, which is much, you know, lower temperature and has lots of different conditions in it. So even, you know, for biodegradability, it's not one environmental, um, you know, it's not one, one environmental degradation characteristic that you have to optimize for. But I think, uh, like Jack said, for some applications, it's going to be really important. And to me, the ones where it's most important are 
or really things that are really tightly linked to food use where in an ideal system, if you could clearly mark things, those could all go towards something like composting. You know, if you, if you had a system where you actually efficiently collecting compost and you could put your biodegradable materials in there, they're much, much more likely to be able to degrade under, you know, comp standard composting conditions than they are, you know, as sitting in the middle of the ocean or, you know, sitting just, you know, on someone's deck. So I think it's a, it's a really difficult process. I think getting better standards is going to be key. And I think realizing it's not a, uh, like Jack said, a silver bullet for, for all plastics because um, we do rely on them for so many things where we can't have them biodegrading, you know, before we want them to is, is another, you know, critical part of that. Yeah, I, I, I think it relates back to the education issue you were talking about too. You know, having standards that people know what they're buying, but then also educating people about what a biodegradable product, you know, what what should be done with it, and and you know, what uh, how to sort it, right? Because uh, it uh, it obviously has radically different properties from the things you want to send into your recycling processes. Um, there's also I'm gonna I'm gonna leverage your um, your uh, chemical biology background, Jay. There's there's definitely interest, and in, and you alluded to some you know biological processes for uh, for taking sort of converted feedstocks and trying to trying to convert them into into new polymers. But what about just on the on the degradation side itself? Um, when you look at the at the technologies, you talked about a chemical technology for depolymerizing PET, um, what, how do you sort of see the balance of opportunities between biological, you know, enzymatic um, breakdown versus chemical? So, you know, I'm in the bioenergy technologies office, but, um, uh, you know, to be blunt, I think there's a lot more application for, for chemical processes here. I think there are really certain um, areas in which biological processes could have a really interesting role. Um, you know, particularly for things like PET that was previously mentioned, there's companies like Carbios that are developing, you know, enzymatic solutions to be able to cleave those bonds. There's people developing uh, things to, to cleave, um, you know, bonds in, in polyurethanes or other kinds of more labile bonds where, where enzymes can be really specific and go in and do what we know things like cellulases can do uh, on biomass, you know, to cleave cellulose apart. And I think there will be applications like that um, for which biology is well suited. We're doing what we're doing a lot of in the bottle consortium is really looking at um, a TEA and LCA breakdown there to say when is it when are you actually going to see benefit, um, you know, particularly from a greenhouse gas emissions uh, reduction perspective from utilizing a biological solution, utilizing really low um, temperature processing for these types of things. I think that's where we want to target, you know, those biological solutions versus you know trying to to make them really stretch and do things that they're you know, not particularly great at like uh, breaking CC bonds. I mean, it, it is possible to break uh, CC bonds in something like polyethylene with biology, but it's maybe not practical. There are other types of CC bonds like in polystyrene that maybe are more targetable um, and might have some sort of, a, you know, eventual, eventual biological solution, you know, if you can find the right kinds of enzymes or, or organisms. But it's going to be a much heavier lift than I think it is uh, for things like, like chemical processing, at least in the, in the short term. Yeah, it, it seems like even just getting contact between the enzyme and a hydrophobic piece of plastic is is itself a, a challenge, regardless of its of its activity. So, um, For sure. Yep. <laughs> I, I I have a, a, a sort of more general question. So when you showed that energy breakdown, um, it, both in terms of greenhouse gas emissions and then and then the energy going into plastic production. Um, Obviously, the recycling, you know, you can save that block associated with the feedstocks if you're, if you're recycling, right? So there's big savings there. But is the, the process energy, so, so how do you think of that? Because is, it, yeah, how much savings or can you have savings in, in, in the process energy block? Because now you have to add the energy of the deconstruction plus whatever purification, you know, new challenges arise if you're, if you're, creating monomers this way, and then the energy of the polymerization, which I realize is not the full process energy, but, but how do you sort of think about what the potential savings are, if any, in the process part? Yeah, I think, I think that's a great question. Um, you know, there, there are, you know, different types of 
polymerization methods that you know you you could potentially use that would be you know lower temperature or milder processing that people have you know been discussing with with green chemistry solutions to things you know i think a lot of it might be more you know synergistic with other things like say incorporating you know bio-based monomers into something and then figuring out a new processing condition that uses those types of monomers and um, say partially petroleum monomers you know in a, in a different type of process that was you know, less energy intensive overall. But I, I do, I, I definitely uh, hear, hear you in terms of that being a difficult one to, um, you know, to really see massive improvements in. And this is why, you know, I think for energy savings, we're really looking at, you know, 50% 50, 50 supply chain energy, um, which is, I think, a really ambitious target. But it's, you know, given the administration's, uh, you know, love of, of deep decarbonization and saying things are going to be 100%, um, you know, carbon neutral, this is one area where we're probably not going to get there, um, you know, without a, a radically changed method of, of something like producing plastics. Okay. There, there may be a, a little bit of a twist on that story, too. You know, um, a lot of the plastics that we use rely on aromatic compounds, benzene, titan, xylene, and, and these have largely come from refineries. And uh, in the future, you know, perhaps, you know, as we, as we wean ourselves off of fossil fuels for transportation, those sources could become more limited. There are processes that you can use starting with plastics to make those molecules. And so you're not necessarily, you know, fundamentally changing the energy content of the material, but you've rearranged the molecules in a way that if you had to start from scratch, it would be a, a very high energy input. So, um, I hear what you're saying, you know, you're, you know, you probably can't save a lot of energy on the processing side, but you may in the future allow yourself to have more flexibility for feedstocks as, as fossil fuels get weaned out, weaned, weaned away, and we need to find new routes to making chemicals that are otherwise valuable for us. Thanks, Jack. Yeah, yeah, I actually, actually, yes, sorry, go ahead, Jay. Yeah, please. One quick add on to that, but you made me think of Jack. That's a really great point. Um, so the, the IBM process that I mentioned earlier, actually, I didn't put this on there, but when they deconstruct a monomer, they're actually deconstructing to a molecule called DHET, uh, which has the ethylene, or which has the glycol units on either side of your uh, terephthalic acid. So your monomer actually already has, um, you know, is, is linked together and is going to take less processing energy to go to your final product than if you started with, you know, those monomers separately. So that's Another way we're using recycled content could save you not only on the feedstock side, but actually in the processing side too, since it requires less processing at the end of the day. So that's probably a smaller example, but just one way that you could, you don't have to break plastic all the way back down into complete monomers. You could break it back down into something like oligomers that can be built back up more easily. Yeah, so you're sort of targeting the deconstruction to the, the, the units that are the easiest to turn back into the, the higher value polymer. Um, that's great. You guys, uh, I, I don't know if that was intentional or not, Jack, but you you addressed the, the currently the top question in the poll about, you know, what what happens to the the economics as um, petroleum decreases if, if transportation fuel uh, starts to decline. Maybe um, since we're, we're getting a little bit late, I'll, I'll, I'll close with uh, a question, uh, kind of a broad question. Um, Related to this idea of, of sourcing, and uh, uh, Jay or Jack or both of you could comment that. So, if you if you think about you know farming practices and the greenhouse uh, gas footprint and the global warming potential of farming practices, um, then can you comment on sort of how you how you source bio based feedstocks and how that can impact mm. the the overall. Uh, life cycle of a, you know, uh, a quote, renewable polymer. Yeah, I, I'm happy to take that one um, and, and feel free to add your, your thoughts, Jack, too. Um, so sourcing bio-based materials um, to help to, you know, replace fossil inputs is something that we think about a lot in my office. Um, often it's for making things like fuels, but I think the same principle applies for plastics. Um, Bio-based feedstocks are a complicated thing, right? You can do it very wrong. You can, you know, grow uh, really energy intensive crops and then utilize them in really energy intensive processes and actually end up with 
you know, worse emissions than you would if you just use petroleum feedstock. So I'll preface this with you have to do it carefully, but I think that it, when done right, it, it can be uh, really environmentally beneficial. And so we take a lot of uh, effort in doing our life cycle analyses on, you know, crops that are grown in different ways with different, you know, cropping practices, things like uh, purpose grown energy crops often can really help fix a lot of soil or fix a lot of carbon into the soil. And so you can actually end up with, you know, potentially net negative um, materials because you've been actually been able to fix so much carbon into the soil through growing your crop that when you harvest and then turn that into a material, your, your total, you know, if your system boundary is the entire process, you've actually fixed more carbon than you've uh, put into things. I, I wouldn't say that that's, you know, a typical uh, thing for a bio, bio source material, but what we're finding out is there are options even for things like corn that are grown now, um, the newest estimates are that that making ethanol out of that corn is about 40% uh, less greenhouse gas intensive per, uh, you know, gasoline gallon equivalent than um, using petroleum. And there's ways that, you know, by tacking, say, like carbon sequestration or carbon utilization onto the fermenters that make those, uh, you know, make that ethanol, you can actually get that down even lower. And so I think, you know, we're just beginning um, with, with, especially with the focus of this new administration on, you know, deep decarbonization and, and reducing global warming potential of products to think about all those options, weigh them out in, in terms of the, their techno-economic, um, you know, impacts and, and pick the lowest hanging fruit to really improve the uh, overall greenhouse gas emissions associated with, you know, bio-based feedstocks. But um, I guess my message overall would just be, that you have to be careful and you have to do it right, but I think there's a lot of potential. Yeah, maybe I'll just add, because I completely agree. You've got to be careful. You've got to do it right. You know, there's always been this notion of uh, food versus fuel or, or you know, this potential competition when you use biological source materials. Um, but it's important to point out that a lot of times biology may be trying to help us here in ways that we're not thinking about. You know, uh, um, you know there's a, a biopolymer, lignin, which nobody wants to eat for really good reasons. And it has a lot of very interesting properties. And so perhaps we need to think about, you know, the, uh, the biorefinery concept again, in terms of what it could yield as far as novel materials for what may be plastics different than what we have today, but, but plastics that could have valuable properties by harvesting those parts of the, uh, of the biomass that really don't compete for, for food or even for fuel in some cases. That's great. I, I, yeah, I think I'll, I'll take this opportunity to to highlight what I, actually what I hope has been apparent over the past uh, hour and fifteen minutes or so. That you know, we I, I prefaced their talks by saying that you know Jack and Jay spent a lot of time thinking about crafting programs to help spur innovations and create new technologies, and and hopefully you've you've seen some of that today. Um, and, and really seeing the tremendous uh, potential of that. What they, what they also do, which I think is a really critical um, piece of this, this whole area, is they spend a lot of time crafting programs and supporting researchers who really do the hard analysis to answer questions like this. What, what does and doesn't make sense with respect to the, the problem we're trying to solve? Um, there's, there's really a science in, uh, in conducting those types of analyses properly seeking out the, the right data and, and using that to, to inform the, the solutions. Uh, so uh, in, in the interest of, of time, I, I, I think I'm gonna wrap up the, the uh, official Q&A se uh, session here. Um, I wanna encourage you again to, to join the, the, the LinkedIn group, um, can connect with us at the, the Tomcat Center um, with, with additional uh, follow-up and, and let me, um, let me just take the opportunity to, to thank our, our speakers uh, once again for a really, a really fantastic evening. Thank you so much for, for spending time with us and, and uh, lending us your, your insights. Thanks for the opportunity. It was really enjoyable. Thank you. Yeah, it's been, been a pleasure to be here and talk with you all. Thank you so much.